Welcome to the EY Next Wave Private Equity Podcast, where we explore what's happening now, next, and beyond in the world of PE. Digital, sector, talent, value creation, ESG. These topics are top of mind for executives across the global private equity ecosystem. Join us for the insights you need to reframe the future of private equity. Now, here's your host, Weena Brown from EY. Today, I'm joined by Sally Jones, leader of our trade strategy practice in London. Sally's primary focus is advising companies on the implications of Brexit and specifically how to operate in the post-Brexit world. Sally, I'm really excited to have you on the podcast. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Well, so before we dive into the discussion, I mean, Brexit has been the topic of much debate and speculation since June 2016, when the UK asked its electorate whether they should remain a member of the European Union. I know I'm not the only person to have been quite shocked by the result of that referendum. And in fact, I can very clearly remember exactly where I was when those results were announced. Since then, it's been a long four years of negotiation and lack of clarity, all culminating on December 24th, 2020, Christmas Eve, when an agreement between Britain and the EU was finally reached. So Sally, are you able to maybe share with us what's happened since Christmas Eve and that historic moment when the Brexit agreement was finally secured? So we had the announcement on Christmas Eve, but we didn't have any of the detail. They let us have Christmas Day off, and then published all 1,246 glorious pages on Boxing Day the 26th. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. And that was a deal that went live on New Year's Eve, 31st of December, 11pm. The the deal has still not been ratified, but that's not a huge concern. Both sides are treating that as basically a formality. Much more of a concern is the fact that businesses and governments had six days to absorb all of the detail and some critical aspects, like, for example, the final version of the UK's border operating model, were published four hours before the deal went live. That gave businesses no time to react. Wow. And were the details anticipated? Like, did people know what was coming or was it all just brand new? Some details were anticipated. Uh, Some were brand new. So that made it really, really difficult for business to decide how to proceed. I'll give you a real life example. Rules of origin. Now, rules of origin are turgid and boring and complicated. And it's easiest for for non-trade people to think of them best as being anti-avoidance. So imagine, uh, Winner, just for the moment, a scenario where I want to sell my products to you. You're in the US, I'm in the UK, and there's, for the sake of argument, a 10% tariff. And I think to myself, hmm, the UK's got a trade deal with Canada that reduces tariffs to 0%. US has got a trade deal with Canada that reduces tariffs to 0%. Why don't I sell my products to a friend in Canada who can then send them on to you? No tariffs, bingo. Now, that's not how life works, of course. In that scenario, unless my friend in Canada has done something substantial to change the product, then the authorities in the US will look straight through my friend and just treat it exactly as if I transferred my products directly to you. Rules of origin tell us when something substantial has been done. But there are a dozen or so different measures of substance, and they vary from product to product service to service, sector to sector, country to country. That's the kind of detail that wasn't published in advance. So we knew that there were going to be rules of origin. We just didn't know what any of them would look like, which made it incredibly difficult for companies to prepare because they just didn't know which tests they were going to have to apply. Got it. Okay. And all right. So if I just try and take that and think of it in terms of private equity, and I think about the two sides of private equity, you know, broadly, you've got their investees, and secondly, you've got the top of the house. And the rules that you just described now feels to me like it would greatly impact investees, so the companies. So when I think about a company who's private equity backed and trying to deal with these trade-related topics and, and the new rules that were coming out, How did these companies actually react on the 1st of January? I mean, the 1st of January, most of the world shut down. But yet, you know, there's a whole different 
set of rules, a different playbook they had to play by. What did they do? It varied, honestly, from from sector to sector. So perhaps unsurprisingly, the people who had to deal with Brexit change first were the people who move goods that can't be stockpiled. So that's perishable goods like agri-food. I don't know if you've seen in the in the press that fisher fleets have had real trouble moving their fish from the UK to the EU and vice versa. Can't stockpile fish. You have to place it on the market within six days of it being caught. Um, it can be fast fashion. So some of our fashion stores uh, have a six-week turnaround on stock lines. The clothes that are in a store uh, now are completely different from the clothes lines that were there six weeks ago. It can be things that are made bespoke. So um, spectacles, contact lenses, that kind of stuff that's done specific to a prescription, that can't be stockpiled. Or it can be repairs. So if I break something, often a piece of technological equipment, oftentimes it won't be repaired in the UK, it'll be repaired somewhere else. And so that, that somewhere else will involve a border crossing and that's holding up things like repairs. Those goods flows were the ones that struggled straight off. And in some ways they were lucky because freight volumes were significantly down on the same period last year. And they, in fact, still haven't recovered to the level we would expect based on prior year, mostly because people have been stockpiling, which meant that the worst impacts of Brexit, the queues of lorries some of us were fearing, didn't come to pass. But though that lock of, lack of lorry queue is not a good thing. It means that, that goods aren't even getting to the borders in the first instance, and that's a real problem for anyone who's trying to get hold of anything that's that's coming across a border. In some ways, and I'm being a little bit tongue in cheek here, but in a lot of ways, goods movements have got it good compared to services. And the reason I say that is that the impact for goods are more paperwork, more cost, potentially tariffs if you can't get into the right rules of origin position. But those things are just... I'm doing the kind of inverted commas things with my fingers, which you can't see because it's a sound recording, but it's it's just cost. And for sure, there'll be some transactions which are no longer profitable and won't take place, but basically trade can continue. Services, which have got virtually nothing in the trade deal to help them, can face a situation where it becomes unlawful to trade, not just more expensive, but actually unlawful. And because those aren't getting delayed at the border, they're just not happening at all, they're not really getting the same level of attention. So when you say services, you mean people kind of going over borders to deliver these services? Or do you even mean virtually delivery? Oh, oh, it can be both. (laughs) So when, (laughs) when you're looking at services, you have to answer three questions. The first question is, can I still lawfully under the domestic statute of the country I wish to provide my services in, can I still lawfully provide those services? And sometimes the answer is yes. So for unregulated services like training provision or recruitment, often the time is yes. But for regulated services, oftentimes the answer is just a flat no. You may no longer lawfully provide your services in our country from the UK. So that's question number one. Question number two is all right, I can provide my services lawfully. Can I physically get myself into that country to deliver my services? And that's that's another two-part question. The first is, do I need a visa to physically travel to that country? And the answer on visas is that basically you're allowed in for visits for 90 days out of any rolling 180-day period, but that visits includes holidays as well. So that's come as a nasty shock to companies. They didn't realise that they're going to have to track how many days of holiday their staff were spending in Europe, as well as how many days of business they were spending in Europe. But then again, ancillary question to that one is, do I need a work permit to do the business I want to do in Europe? And oftentimes the answer is yes, the definition of work activities that can be performed without a work permit are pretty scant. They're basically ancillary activities like training courses or attending a conference, not your day-to-day job. So many people are now finding that in a COVID world, post-COVID world, I should say, they may well not be able to physically go to the country they want to go to without a visa, without a work permit, and those things are expensive and difficult to obtain. Third question you have to ask then is, 
having worked out that I can provide my services, but I can't deliver them in person? Can I deliver them remotely, as you say? And that is also, sadly, not a straightforward answer, because that involves data flowing between the EU and the UK. And we don't yet have certainty that that data can continue to flow in four months' time. The Commission needs to grant the UK an adequacy decision in order for that to happen. It hasn't yet done so. When I'm feeling optimistic, I hope that it will, but there are certain things on the UK statute books that make that difficult. It is possible that just as the US doesn't have an adequacy decision, neither too will the UK, which puts the companies into a whole new world of pain. Wow. (laughs) Okay. That is a lot to unpack. Isn't it? (laughs) And... I guess just a couple of thoughts. I mean, there's many thoughts that are coming to mind, but I guess I'm thinking, how are firms dealing with this? I mean, there's been up to now, you know, people have moved freely between the UK and Europe for the longest time working on, you know, projects or businesses. And I think about, you know, private equity that are very focused on value creation and moving their people you know, to the different locations where their their investees are, are headquartered. So we're saying they won't be able to do that and they can't work remotely. So what does that mean? You have to only engage in country? Potentially, yes. I think we'll see a lot more of that in-country engagement going forward. There are provisions that allow intercompany transfers for a period of up to three years, but no longer than three years. And again, the definition of intercompany transfer is pretty narrow. It's wholly impossible to imagine just how different the world is going to look like once COVID restrictions have been lifted. uh, And we're into this world where the end of free movement of people will fundamentally change the way Europeans and British nationals do business together. Wow. So, Do you think that the difference then could manifest itself or or one of the solutions, I should say, would be where maybe UK headquartered companies or private equity companies would set up a European operation and then have its people flow freely amongst the European countries and, and just really kind of almost have a physical separation between both sides of their businesses? Yes, we're seeing that kind of physical separation start to be discussed in earnest among a number of different country, companies now. So that kind of people movement point is is one that we're seeing coming up. We're also seeing pressure for that physical separation to take place because of regulatory reasons. So to give you a real life example, one of my clients makes electrical equipment for in people's homes. And they'd gone to an awful lot of time and trouble to prepare their business for Brexit in terms of customs procedures and supply chain. But the thing that they'd not taken into account is that if you make electrical equipment for in people's homes, there are very strict EU directives that basically say, and I am paraphrasing a bit here, but what they basically say is don't burn down people's homes, don't electrocute people. And if you do either of those two things, then we want an entity with proper substance in the EU that we can punish for your negligence. And for my particular client, when they looked through the rules, they realised that although they had some EU subsidiaries, none of them had enough substance to meet the requirements of those EU directives. So with a handful of months to go, they had to suddenly decide where within the EU they were going to put more substance because without that regulatory permission, they couldn't lawfully sell their products into the EU anymore, where they were going to put that substance, what substance they were going to put in, which regulator they were going to approach to check that they were doing sufficient, which people they were going to move into Europe or recruit into alternative positions, how they were going to update their IT systems, how they were going to inform their customers of the change, how it was going to impact on their transfer pricing, because all of a sudden you've now got a lot more tax activity taking place in Europe than had been before and get it all signed off and do all of that by 31 December. It was an absolute uphill scramble to get that done. And so that's a real life example, quite separate from people movements, but where the business model required fundamental change just to keep trading. Wow. Okay. And how many 
companies in your experience, because obviously you've been dealing with a lot of companies, how many companies have actually woken up to the fundamental changes that they're going to have to implement in order to continue to do business? It's a mixed bag, I think. So British businesses, unsurprisingly, were quite aware for quite a long time that change was coming. Admittedly, they didn't know exactly what change was coming, but quite a lot of them took the approach of planning for the worst, even though they hoped for the best. European businesses, I think, were probably a little bit less prepared. And that wasn't unsensible of them, uh, because oftentimes the approach that they took was that the UK was a relatively small part of their overall European sales, and they would wait and see to see what happened before they made expensive decisions. Um, similar, similar approach, actually, from US businesses. But the end result of that wait and see position is that some people got lucky. Their facts and circumstances meant that they could continue to trade in a relatively undisrupted way. Uh, but the ones that do have disruption, I think it has come come to their attention pretty strongly now. Whether it's not really being able to access zero tariffs or having delays in their supply chain when they just can't get stuff across the border, or a realisation that actually they're not going to be able to trade lawfully in the way that they'd wanted to but in the past with people moving between countries freely. Those are the kind of things where people have started to really wake up now. And look, I can see and paint the picture how this is impacting or starting to impact all the different you know, companies in different sectors, especially those, as you said, who have goods that they're trying to transfer or, or to your point about the electrical example. If we kind of shift that and think about private equity and we think about the top of the house, you know, so financial services, how are we finding the rules are impacting the financial services sector? I mean, my understanding at the moment is that there's still a lack of clarity around the rules that will govern that sector. Yes, that's right. So what we've got in the trade deal is a commitment by both sides to set out a framework for future cooperation with that framework to be set out by March 2021. That will include the equivalence decisions which the EU has yet to make. So to recap, the EU had made temporary equivalence decisions in respect of clearing uh, and central securities depositories, recognising the importance of the existing UK infrastructure for EU markets and hence financial stability risk. But it hadn't otherwise made any other equivalence decisions or taken any steps to smooth the transition for financial services. And of course, not all financial services is covered by equivalents in any case. So the honest answer for for financial services is that it was quite the cliff edge that because of the, the intensely regulated nature of the sector, most businesses had already planned for no deal anyhow. And we've seen moves of of private equity and and banks and insurers out of the UK to European markets precisely for that reason. So we haven't seen the same level of disruption in in financial services as elsewhere because they'd already bitten the bullet and got themselves ready. So the but the sheer fact, I guess, of of moving and having a presence in the EU has, I guess, given them leeway while this the rules are being clarified. Correct. So they can keep operating undisrupted. Correct. Absolutely. Okay. And then if we think about deal activity and M&A activity, if I think about it going forward, if you have an e- a UK only deal, it, you know, it was previously, I guess, referred to the European Commission for approvals. Now, I guess it's going to be, you know, help the, the approvals are going to be sought with the Competition and Markets Authority in the UK. What do you think the UK agency will have as a policy? Do you think they're going to adopt a more protectionist stance or are they going to be focused on attracting more foreign investment into the UK? Because it sounds like right now the UK is, is in a bit of trouble in the sense that a lot of people are leaving the UK. Well, it's interesting you say that very timely question because yesterday UNCTAD published its Global Investment Trade Monitor and it showed a massive fall in foreign direct investment in the UK for 2020 compared to 2019. When I say massive, I mean it fell to zero. It fell off a cliff. The the investment into the UK from foreign investors just tanked. So based on that, I think that on the whole, the UK is going to want to adopt measures that attract FDI. I think it has to. But equally, there are a handful of places where policies may not be as 
leaning towards attractiveness as opposed to protectionism, as you might think. So a couple of points. First is there's been some speculation over the British corporation tax rate. We are currently 19%. It may go up uh, basically to help fill the holes in the coffers caused by COVID. And the other thing just to flag is the National Security and Investments Bill. This is legislation that could give retrospective powers to the government in respect of takeovers, which subsequently turn out not to be in the national interest for for a whole race raft of different reasons. Um, That's attracted a certain amount of, of concern among investors who fear that they will either divest something that turns out that they shouldn't have divested in that way or that they'll buy something that they shouldn't have bought in that way and that that retrospective nature may come back to bite them. We're seeing some fairly intense lobbying efforts in some quarters from businesses pointing out just how damaging that could be for UK attractiveness. So just to understand that fully, you're saying a deal that was potentially previously approved by the European Commission is now subject to retrospective unraveling by the UK Competition and Markets Authority? Is that is that what you're saying? Sorry, no, Winner, I've been really misleading to you there. What I'm saying is that there will be a five-year look-back period, but only in respect of deals that are take place from now onwards. Got it. So uh, you could sell a business now and find in five up to five years' time that there was an issue. But no, if it were five years ago from now, you'd be fine. Okay, got it. But still, that, to your point, causes a great deal of uncertainty because you can enter into a transaction today not knowing if in four years' time someone will rule against the transaction and unravel it. Yes, that's exactly the point. Wow. Okay. That is pretty significant. It is. When is there going to be clarity around these rules? So the draft legislation has been published. It's currently going through the UK parliamentary process. Which could take a while. Could take a while. And in the meantime, companies, I'm sure, and investors are making alternate arrangements and looking for different countries in which to transact and and find the next deal, if you will. Yes, I think that's probably right. I mean, whether, whether investors continue to see UK assets as being a good investment, I think is going to depend entirely on whether they're seen as being valued as attractive. Uh, many of the aspects that the UK made the UK attractive before remain in place. Of course, we still have a solid legal regime, stability, very low corruption index, you know, educated workforce, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All of those things are still in place, and I think part of that is reflected by the fact that sterling has pretty much held steady against both the dollar and uh, indeed strengthened slightly against the euro since the start of the year. But the effect of Brexit on the economy is expected to emerge much more slowly, but to be permanent. So the UK's economy is estimated will be 5% smaller over the next 15 years than it would have been without Brexit. And that's two times bigger overall than the impact of COVID. That is very significant. And then then thinking about that and taking, you know, thinking about the UK economy and the attractiveness, I mean, a very important aspect of the PE life cycle is exit strategies. And I've noticed there's been a few announcements of late where prominent UK-based private equity-backed companies are actually seeking to list in the US. Now, do you think this is coincidence or do you think that Brexit perhaps has played, uh, has had an impact on the attractiveness of the London Stock Exchange? Well, I would have said coincidence until a recent German report I was reading that said that the US has now become the most attractive G7 location. It was the UK. UK is still second. But maybe that's playing into it a little bit. We've got reasonably small numbers, of course. So it's it's hard to say whether it is just outliers or a trend emerging because the listing regime itself shouldn't be impacted by Brexit. But whether Brexit has made the overall attractiveness to the UK fall is a is a different matter, I guess. I think that's one that we'll just have to keep an eye on. Hmm. Interesting. And when you look in your crystal ball. How are you seeing the next couple of years unfold for the UK? I think we're going to see a period of disruption that will come in waves between now and Easter 2021. So we've spoken about the issues with goods that are being picked up now. I do think regulatory is going to come to the fore. People mobility will come to the the fore a bit later when COVID travel restrictions ease a little, and we've got this data point still to worry about. But I do think that by 
Easter, maybe April, May sort of time, we'll know the lie of the land because the immediate disruption will have settled. Then I think the question will become, is the shape of my UK business right for the brave new world or not? And for some businesses, the answer will be actually yes, we've done a lot better than we thought we would, particularly relative to our competitors. For other businesses, it'll be no, we need to take steps now to either move activities out of the UK and into Europe or the other way around or out of Europe altogether, depending on what's going on, or look at new markets or look at new ways of trading. And I think that will be the way that the next 12 months after that will play out. It'll be looking at right sizing, resizing, reshaping exactly what UK activities each business is undertaking. So let me ask you this then, if I think about a private equity firm and I think about the top of the house and I think about uh, the companies that it invests in, what advice would you give you know, those at the head of the PE complex as they think about investing and they think about you know, creating value at their portfolio companies? What advice would you give them to navigate through post-Brexit? And, and of course, the inevitable question will be, what, will you give, what advice would you give those companies that are trying to operate, expand and grow? So for the top of the house, I think the time has come to pay more attention than you otherwise would do to how your portfolio companies are are trading. Because the risk is that value could erode pretty quickly without you really noticing if you haven't got your eye on the ball. And again, a number of the companies that we speak to in this space are taking a much, much more active stance with their investees right now than they normally would do. And the investee companies get that. They understand why it's happening and they're very open in many cases. For the investee companies themselves, then, we've got five pieces of advice that will actually apply to any change situation, in particular for Brexit. First is... Make sure you've got a response team in place with senior people on it who you can contact if you need to during the night or at weekends if something's gone a bit wrong. And make sure they're senior enough that they can make decisions without having to refer them on. That's point number one. Point number two is keep communicating. You can't over communicate with your customers, your suppliers and your workforce right now. If you're going to have a delay, speak to your customer as soon as possible so that they understand and can take their own steps. Keep talking to your suppliers because they may have alternatives that they wouldn't think to raise with you unless you've got open communication lines. Um, You cannot over communicate in times of change. Third is that point around data. If you've got data flowing from the EU to the UK, do keep an eye on whether there's going to need to be some pretty rapid changes to your contract terms or your internal governance to stay on top of legally flowing your data, not least because the sizes of the fines are enormous if you get it wrong. So it might not be top of your likelihood list, but it it would be pretty impactful if it were to happen to you. Fourth is your cost base. Your cost base is going to change. It's going to go up and you are going to need to decide what you're going to do about that. And your choices are basically absorb it yourself and accept that margin will be eroded, pass it on to your customers or push it back on your suppliers. And those are really your only three choices. Which of those is right for you will depend on your product and how elastic its price is, what your competitors are doing, how thin your margins are already. But being on top of your cost base so you can turn off unprofitable trades is going to be really important. And then fifth, And final point is make sure you understand the new regulation, whether it's new labelling or new disclosures or new authorisations or new licences or a new subsidiary you need to put into Europe. The faster you get on top of that, the quicker you'll be able to resume normal trade. Sally, thanks so much for your time today and for the really great insights and words of advice. Even though there's an agreement in place, it sounds like there is much to learn and many more details and practicalities to work out as the world gets used to life after Brexit. And of course, the clear message here is that those private equity complexes who get ahead of navigating these changes will likely be more successful in the long run. Thanks for tuning in to the EY Next Wave Private Equity Podcast. For more thought-leading perspectives and to get in touch with Weena Brown, visit ey.com slash private equity. You can also follow us on Twitter at EY Private Equity. We'll see you on the next episode.